may begin. Uh, thank you, Rick, and thank uh, the entire Principal Solar team. I appreciate the opportunity to be presenting another webinar. I, I didn't know I had the honor of being the first repeat presenter. Um, I would like to mention that uh, although the title of the webinar is uh, specifically refers to solar project finance, and obviously the, the uh, sponsor is Principal Solar, uh, these techniques are applicable to all forms of renewable energy finance, including wind, biomass, geothermal, and, and hydro and wave power. Um, the intent of this presentation is to distinguish, actually, project finance from corporate finance. If, for example, a large investment-grade investor-owned utility uh, wants to build a new power plant, it has lots of ways to uh, to finance that plant whether it is a uh, you know a fossil or a renewable energy plant and they operate both uh, but the point is if a big company wants to borrow money generally there are plenty of people lining up to to finance it and they will be curious about the specifics of the project but as a senior you know bank lender and senior creditor to a, a large company they know that they can rely on the full faith and credit of that company regardless of whether or not that particular project works out. Um, generally, a company, a large company, will have multiple revenue streams. It will have, you know, cash in the bank and securities on the balance sheet, uh, and it will have access to other forms of finance. So there are many forms in which a lender against a project uh, financed on a corporate finance basis can get paid back. On the other hand, a project finance lender can only look to the cash generated by the specific project it is financing. And therefore, there are, you know, uh, several considerations, uh, you know, what you might call belt and suspender structures that the lenders uh, have to rely on in order to make sure that the, the one and only project, which is going to get them paid back, uh, does in fact work. Um, now, we'll be talking first about, say, a, a base case for the sake of simplicity, where a project sponsor, developer, use those terms sort of uh, inter interchangeably, you know, has some equity to invest and will essentially borrow the rest. So we'll talk about what are the structures that will make that project finance lender comfortable that he will, in fact, get his money back. Um, we will talk about other types of income streams that may be available on renewable energy projects as opposed to revenues from the sale of power. And here I'm speaking about uh, the renewable energy credit market talk about the, the actual mechanics a little bit of project finance loans and bonds, uh, and then to the extent that other equity investors need to be brought in for a project, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of those considerations. Uh, and finally, the tax benefits that are uniquely available to renewable energy products. And once we go through the tax benefits that are available, talk a little bit about the the financial structures which utilize those tax benefits. So if you have a developer which does not have sufficient taxable income to absorb those benefits itself, it can essentially bring in you know, tax-sensitive investor partners in one form or another uh, to efficiently use those benefits. The reason that you want to do that is because if there are available tax benefits which the developer cannot use, and he doesn't use some of these tax-oriented uh, financial techniques, his, uh, his project will be more expensive to finance and less profitable to operate than it will be for somebody who can use the tax benefits are available. Uh, and these tax benefits are generally a unique aspect of the, the U.S. market because while in other parts of the world they have government subsidies, they tend to be in the form of feed-in tariffs, uh, and as a result, much of this is somewhat unique to, to what happens in the U.S. market. Uh, but uh, moving along to, uh, to the first slide, um, what is project finance exactly? As, as I had referred to, it's the financing of a project based on only the risks 
and the future cash flows of that particular project uh, without recourse to a corporate obligor. Um, where it came from were corporate developers of large energy and infrastructure project who essentially didn't want to bet the company on an entire project and were able to successfully come up with a way to transfer the risks from the balance sheet of the sponsor company to external lenders and investors. Um, the technology they were able to come up with involved a series of contracts and guarantees which cover everything from the design and construction of an energy project through its operation and the sale of its output. And essentially the name of the game is if you don't have somebody you can sue, if things go wrong, you have to make sure you control uh, every single aspect of design, construction, and operation. And that is generally what the whole project finance structure does. Um, what, what you're really looking for is certainty that an income stream will be generated, a revenue stream will be generated that will both pay the operating costs and ultimately repay the financiers. Now in project finance that can come in a number of different flavors. In in power projects, like we're talking about here, uh, we're generally talking about power purchase agreements. In other forms of uh, project financing, such as toll roads, you may be dealing with an operating agreement which determines how the, uh, the developer of the road project uh, will pay for it, operate it, collect the tolls, and, and pay back his uh, lenders and investors. Uh, in the case of projects such as transmission lines, you may have a capacity purchase agreement where the developer will uh, string the wires and then basically rent out the electrical carrying capacity uh, to somebody who is in the business of selling electrons. The, uh, the project developer is not a merchant provider of electricity. He's just renting his distribution system. Uh, in oil field development, you know, you may have a production sharing agreement where essentially first revenues cover operating costs, second revenues, second level of revenues cover principal and interest to the lenders, and then after that's been covered, the developer can take his progress out, his profits out. Uh, and then finally, something that you may run into from time to time in the renewable energy world, generally on wind deals, not so much in solar, is uh, pure merchant financing where financiers are comfortable enough that the market is good, the technology works, uh, the revenues are going to be strong, even if you're selling into the spot market, so you do not require uh, long-term power purchase agreements because you know that selling every day into the spot market will be sufficient to uh, service your debt. Um, what are the sorts of things that the sponsors look into when they're considering uh, using a project finance rather than, than a corporate finance methodology. Uh, well, with off-balance sheet and sort of non-recourse financing, they know that they can maximize the returns on the equity that they're investing. So that's certainly attractive, and they may also be able to pull in some tax-oriented investors to use the benefits that they, the developers, may not be able to. The trade-off for that is these deals are expensive and time-consuming to document and close. There are many separate uh, agreements which have to be uh, which have to be negotiated. It is very banker and lawyer and time and, and fee intensive. And in addition, uh, because the lenders really need to control the project to make sure they get paid, there are a lot of operating restrictions on the developers, uh, including but not limited to cash sweeps. Um, what are the lenders looking at? Uh, first of all, they need to be looking at a project which is large enough that it is going to be worth the investment they're making in terms of salaries of the people who are putting the deal together and the external fees that they need to pay. At the end of so that, that's probably talking about a 50 to $100 million deal to essentially turn the machine on in a big bank project finance department. 
Um, at the end of the day, what they need is to make sure that their receipt of revenue will be contractually enforceable against the creditworthy buyer. In other words, the, the PPA contract has to stand up in court and the contract party has to be good for the money. So, you know, you need both. Um, they will want to think about uh, what is the collateral going to be worth realistically uh, foreclosing and selling the collateral in a project finance deal will not get you paid back. What they need to be able to do is structure the transaction such as they can step into the shoes of the operator, take it over and run it themselves. And that generally is what a project finance credit analysis determines is will that be able to, to be done. Uh, there is the question of technology risk, and the answer is generally lenders don't want to take any. They want to make sure that whatever machinery is being used has had several thousand uh, hours of successful field operations, and there aren't going to be any surprises because if it breaks, you know, they got no way of getting paid back. For the same reason, you're going to be wanting to deal with reputable contractors. You know, they, they have to be bondable, they have to perform. And of course, you're going to be concerned that all the permits are in place because uh, it would not be particularly useful to build a large project and then not have the legal right to operate it. Um, there are a number of project agreements, and there'll be a diagram coming up that sort of shows all these things graphically. Uh, the developer, the sponsor, the guy who's essentially running the show, will enter into an O&M or operating and maintenance agreement. In other words, he comes to work every day and runs the machine and makes sure they stay fixed, in addition to which he'll handle the back office administrative uh, requirements under administrative services agreement. In some cases, these projects will be put together by somebody with proprietary technology. They will therefore want to enter into a technology license agreement between the developer and the project company. The project company is the entity that is actually making and selling the power. With the outside parties who are associated with this project, uh, there will be a large number of other types of contracts. Uh, the first two big ones are the engineering procurement and construction contract, which is with a company like a Bechtel or somebody like that who will design the project, uh, buy the components, and put it all together and make it work. Then there will be the power purchase agreement entered into with either a power user or a, uh, a utility who will, who will redistribute it. In addition to which, uh, if a project is developing renewable energy credits, uh, you will hope to be able to have a long-term off-taker of those credits. To the extent that certain type of projects have other outputs, like biomass projects, for example, which may have steam or uh, carbon dioxide or, or other outputs, you'll be looking to sell them as well. You want to monetize as many income streams as you can. You obviously need to control the land that your project sits on. You may not necessarily want to own it, but you will want a site lease agreement. Uh, you'll need an interconnection agreement to make sure you are connected to a wire that can actually take your power to somebody who can use it. Uh, again, in something like a biomass project, you may need a feedstock supply agreement to make sure that you will have the biomass needed to uh, keep your project fueled. And finally, you may have different types of hedging agreements. For example, if you have, uh, you're selling your power at a spot rate, you may want a long-term rate uh, so that you can hedge your, your revenue and know what it's going to be. On the same side, you may have borrowed floating rate funds and you would probably like to fix that rate uh, just like you would do with a, with a home mortgage so you know on a fixed rate basis, uh, what your costs and revenues are likely to be. Um, you know, if you're buying biomass, again, you certainly want to be able to uh, know and control what your cost of wood is going to be, say, just 
for example, in case, you know, the construction or, or the paper markets come back and all of a sudden other people are competing for your trees, you don't want to spike in your, in your cost of uh, fuel. Okay, uh, to revisit then the, the top two contracts with, with third parties, uh, the PPA is the big one. That's what makes sure there is uh, the revenue coming in that makes the entire project doable. Uh, you want to make sure that it has a sufficient term so that money is coming in for as long as you have financing obligations. Uh, and uh, you, you want to be looking at, obviously, you know, the number of dollars coming in and the number of years they're coming in for. Uh, in some cases, utility-scale projects may be able to negotiate something called take-or-pay contracts under which as long as they have the power ready to be delivered, whether or not their customer takes the power or not, it is required to pay for it. Uh, and then finally, as I had m mentioned earlier, you may be able to do some win projects on a merchant basis where the financiers can get comfortable that you can sell enough power at spot rate to pay the bills. Um, the EPC contract uh, is necessary if the developer does not have an internal construction department. Um, again, that's engineering, procurement, and construction. Uh, the important thing that the EPC contractor will have to show are corporate guarantees and performance bonds for the construction to make sure that the facility will be completed on time and under budget and within budget. Uh, what is actually preferable is so-called full wrap coverage, which says not only will the project get time on, on get done on time and on budget, but it will operate to its specifications and the EPC contractor will remain primarily liable to make sure the thing continues to work. Uh, if you get that sort of strong full wrap coverage, you tend to have bankers who feel warm and fuzzy, and therefore you will be able to get, uh, you know, arguably more leverage because they know they have a financially healthy company. Um, all these things tend to come together in, in the diagram we're showing here. You can see the uh, project company is the red bar in the middle. The equity investors on the upper left invest through the sponsor entity. The lenders uh, interact directly with the project company, and you can see the lenders also show up in the bottom boxes as uh, providing their consent to every third party uh, contract and agreement that the project company enters into. Again, so that if anything happens, the lenders can step into the shoes of the operator, take over the project company, and keep running the project so they can get themselves paid off. And you can see that the uh, ag argument, agreements that get entered into include the interconnect agreement, the purchase prices, the power purchase agreement, the EPC contract, supply contracts for components, uh, if applicable, a renewable energy purchase agreement, the O&M agreement, uh, the administrative services agreement and the technology license agreement, all with the uh, all with the developer. Um, we talked about other revenues. This is something that is unique to the the U.S. renewable energy market, uh, which is the availability of renewable energy credits. These generally grow out of the fact that in many states, about 30, the so-called compliance markets, there is a requirement and this generally is a percentage that increases over time of uh, a percentage of the uh, power generated by the utilities of a given state has to be from uh, renewable or green sources such as solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, biomass, or in some cases in some states, fuel cells and combined heat and power. Um, as a result, uh, well, actually, here, as you can see, um, it's hard to see the specifics on the map, 
There are 30 different jurisdictions. They may range from, you know, 10 to 30 percent requirements over the, anywhere from the next five to 10 years of renewable power to be generated in their states. Uh, and to encourage this to the extent that the investor-owned utilities do not go into the business themselves of building wind and solar plants, uh, they can uh, get credit by buying credits from the independent power uh, uh, entities who do develop uh, renewable plants. So these so-called uh, renewable energy credits are traded in a number of different states on a number of different exchanges. The, the flood exchange is one. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the trading ranges you know, do vary a fair amount. And in general, if you can, uh, if you can see in those, those six different states on the chart, they may, uh, you know, they may stay flat, but for the most part, they're getting lower as they go to the right. New Jersey is a pretty good example. Three years ago, uh, you, could, you could sell solar renewable energy credits for $500 and essentially make four or five times as much selling credits as you could selling power. That was not sustainable. Uh, that's more like $100 a credit now. The other states are bouncing around as well. It remains to be seen uh, whether or not so-called solar recs are ever going to be as big a part of the solar finance equation as they had been a few years ago. Um, now let's get back to the uh, to the structure of loans, they generally come from a couple of different sources, uh, banks, insurance companies, and the government. Um, the, the banks uh, generally uh, arrange these financings in groups. A small group will be a so-called club loan. Uh, a large group will be a syndicated loan. In a club loan, all the banks who are involved in a transaction will face off directly with the borrower and have the same terms. In a syndicated loan, there will be an agent bank who puts it together, who takes the lion's share of the fees, and who uh, underwrites and, and sells down the interests to other lenders. They will generally come in two parts, sort of like construction, a uh, construction loan and a permanent mortgage or a term loan. Um, in addition to which there may be working capital loans for seasonal variations required uh, for cash at different times of the year. But the, once the project is built, you're essentially in a you know, 10 or 20 year permanent loan situation. Uh, insurance companies may provide debt through Section 144A uh, private placements. And there is still some money coming from the government, the Department of Energy uh, loan programs are history now, uh, but the Department of Agriculture, for example, still does provide some money to this sector, although they tend to be not as big as some of the DOE loans had been. They max out at $25 million. Um, we talked about how much control the lenders have over uh, over the control of the cash, um, the so-called waterfall demonstrates how the application of proceeds going once you're selling power and generating revenues. It'll generally go first into a bank lockbox where the operating expenses of the project will first be covered, then the senior lender's principal and interest will be paid, uh, then there will be money set aside for a debt service reserve account just in case there is some sort of interruption in cash flows coming out of the project. Uh, after that, there will be a maintenance reserve account also set apart just so that major components can be uh, repaired or replaced as necessary without an interruption or having to refinance the project. To the extent there's any subordinated debt in the project, the principal and interest on the sub-debt is paid next. and. Last in line are the owners or the, the equity holders. That's, that's when they get paid after all the reserve accounts and the lenders have been paid. Um, the big players in this market are a combination of both public and private sector banks, as you can see. 
in the Americans, in Europe, in Asia, uh, the European project finance banks used to be the dominant players in the renewable energy space. Since the European financial crisis, uh, they have scaled back a bit, and the, the, uh, the components of this list have changed a little bit. Uh, the big players who are the actual project sponsors uh, vary from uh, U.S. utility companies, uh, independent power producer, uh, European project companies, as well as uh, pure financial shops, for example, like Blackstone and Terra Firma out of London. Um, now, uh, when you are putting a project together and the um, uh, the, uh, the developer can write an equity check for X and they can raise debt of Y, if that turns out to be not enough to meet the capital costs of the project, they're probably going to have to dilute themselves and get some, some additional equity investors in. So the question is, of course, how much additional equity do you need to uh, get the project built? And then there's a whole series of uh, things you need to know. Do you want to get a, an active investor like another plant operator, or do you want to get a passive investor more like a, a financial firm, a private equity firm? Uh, these equity investors are going to look at it to a certain extent like lenders do. They want to make sure the numbers work, the uh, deal is profitable, they have to like the technology, they have to like uh, the management, uh, and assuming that all those tests are passed, uh, you then have to determine what is the type of equity investment that will be made. Will it be you know, common versus preferred equity? Uh, preferred equity is more debt-like, it pays a coupon. It's generally not as profitable if everything works, but it is considered a somewhat safer investment. Does that uh, equity investor want seats on the board? Uh, do they require dividends? What is their liquidation prefer preference if there is a problem with the project? And are they going to sit there alongside you, the developer, for the life of the project, or do they want to get bought out in five or ten years? with liquidity event. Those are some of the things you have to think about as well. Um, finally, we get to the section on tax benefits, also relatively unique to the U.S. market. You have essentially investment tax credits, uh, 1603 cash grants, production tax credits, and maker's depreciation. I'll, I'll talk about all of them. Essentially, an investment tax credit is a dollar-for-dollar dollar deduction against your tax bill. So if you are profitable from your other businesses and you have $100 of ITC, that comes right off uh, your tax obligation. Um, most of the primary um, technologies that we look at are eligible for 30% ITC, at least through the end of 2016, I believe. Um, there had been a very successful project, which is mostly uh, over now, which was the 1603 cash grant in lieu of the investment tax credit. That's when the Treasury realized that uh, people who weren't taxpayers didn't get any benefit from ITC. So they, would, they designed a refundable tax credit that as soon as a project was built and placed in service, they would actually write a check for 30% of the cost. Uh, that was essentially the equity used uh, to get these projects financed, and then 70% debt could be retained. Um, unfortunately, this project is for the most, this uh, this, the, the grant is, for the most part, no longer available. There are only uh, grants left for projects that started, uh, commenced, project, commenced uh, construction prior to the end of 2011, and depending on the category of the project, it will either have to be finished and placed in service by the end of this year, for certain technologies or by the end of 2016, you know, for, for solar, certain types of wind, geothermal, 
uh, combined heat and tower, micro turbines, and, and heat pumps. Uh, wind is essentially, you know, all, already gone uh, for ITC purposes. Um, the production tax credit, however, is primarily for wind projects. This was just uh, extended another year in the fiscal cliff bill. That provides for 2.2 cent per kilowatt hour payments for the first 10 years of a qualifying project. Uh, the qualifying project extension has, is for uh, through the end of this year. If you have started a project, once it is placed in service, you get 10 years of PTC payments. And depending on technologies other than wind, the other technologies can get either 2.2 or 1.1 cents per kilowatt hour for the next 10 years. Um, finally, there are depreciation deductions. Uh, a deduction is not a tax credit. A deduction is an offset against taxable income, but if you are paying at a 40% uh, tax rate and you have a dollar of deduction, your taxable income is reduced. So while a dollar of credit is worth a dollar, a dollar of deduction is worth 40 cents at a 40% tax rate. Uh, but you get to de deduct over time uh, the entire cost of your uh, of your investment can be written off unless you have claimed ITC or section 1603 credits, in which case uh, they have a deduction of half the ITC claim. There is a double counting issue. So if you have a million dollar solar project, for example, and you have collected $300,000 worth of ITC, you can't also write off a million dollars of depreciation deductions, but you can write off 850,000. Um, essentially, half that ITC is reduced from your uh, depreciable base, so you've got 300,000 of credits, 850,000 of deductions, which are takeable over five years. Still a pretty good deal as part of the fiscal cliff negotiation, by the way. The so-called bonus depreciation rules were extended, which means that for projects put in service this year, you actually get to take half of your deductions on year one, and the other half of the deductions can be taken over the five-year maker's schedule. Um, so once you have these tax benefits, you can use a number of different structures for incorporating them into your financing structure uh, for a renewable energy product project to the extent that uh, you as the developer cannot use the credits, you can uh, essentially sell them to investors who can, uh, and as a result, you know, you have to require less uh, external financing. Uh, depending on the type of structures you use, by the way, uh, you may even be able to get greater tax credits, a so-called step-up in basis, for a project that you build and then sell and lease back than for a project that you can uh, build and continue to own. Um, the primary different mechanisms that that are used in so-called tax structured finance are the sale leaseback, uh, tax equity or the partnership flip, and the pass-through lease. So uh, let me touch on the basics of how each one of those works. Um, under a sale leaseback, a developer will build a project, sell it to a lessor, lease it back, operate it, and sell power under a PPA. Uh, the sale to the lessor has to take place for 100% of the fair market value. The lessor can claim the investment tax credit and depreciation, uh, and as a result of getting this tax benefits, he can lease back the asset to the developer at a lesser cost than debt financing would be for the same amount of financing. So essentially, uh, the profit to the developer is the difference between what he's selling the power at and the lease payments he needs to make. Um, there are a number of IRS structural guidelines about whether 
the nature of purchase options that can exist, uh, how long the lease can be vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, economic useful life of the, of the, uh, of the project itself. Uh, and from a credit point of view, the lessor is going to want to make sure that the PPA is at least as long as the lease term is, so there is money to pay the lessor. Um, a slightly hairier form of uh, tax-oriented finance is uh, tax equity using the so-called partnership flip structure. Uh, that is where the developer will sell a partial interest. Uh, he will receive, say, 40 to 75 percent uh, of the cost of having built uh, the project. Uh, the investor will then end up in a partnership with the developer after having put this money up. Um, in a partnership, you can have something called the disproportionate allocation, which means that the cash flow or tax benefits you pull out of a partnership investment does not have to be uh, proportional to the amount of money you put in. As a result of which, uh, the developer will get 99%, I'm sorry, the, uh, the tax equity investor will take 99% of the cash flow and tax benefits for as long as tax benefits are being generated, which is in the case of production tax credit, 10 years. In the case of five-year makers, actually six years, as it turns out, uh, at which point the ownership interest will flip the tax equity investor will only keep 5% of the project and 95% ownership will revert to the developer. At this point, the tax benefits are all gone, but it is providing cash flow and the developer will keep that. Um, the developer can then buy the remaining 5% ownership interest from the tax equity investor for what is then fair market value. Uh, the nice thing about tax equity is that the external investors can uh, take benefit of depreciation, ITC, and PTC. Um, finally, you have the inverted lease structure, which is essentially a, uh, a way that an investor who does not want depreciation tax benefits can still get the investment tax credit. So the developer uh, will build the project. Um, he will lease it to the investor. Uh, the investor will actually prepay the lease rentals, which essentially provides the financing to build the project in the first place. During the course of the lease term, the investor will enter into the PPA with the power purchaser, and at the end of the lease term, the investor has taken his tax benefits, he just essentially falls out of the middle, and the developer from that point on continues to own the project and sells power directly uh, to the power purchaser. Uh, Again, in this case, the, because it's a lease, the ITC can claim invest, the investor can claim uh, investment tax credit, but not production tax credit. Um, the big equity investors, for the most part, are financial institutions, uh, the, the same business, businesses that invest in leasing. They are uh, commercial and investment banks and insurance companies, and you know, what we'll call an industrial Google. Um, there aren't that many non-financial customers, non-financial customers, companies who get involved in these businesses because essentially of the, the brain damage involved in, in setting up these investment programs. Um, that is actually uh, sort of the big picture. Um, hope it hasn't been too confusing. Uh, any questions? Thanks, Ken. This was a uh, great overview for the project financing. And for the audience, please chat questions. Send them to all panelists in the lower right corner of your screen. There's a chat window. 
There's a drop-down box that has some options, and you should select all panelists and then send your chat questions to those. I do have um, several questions that have come in, so I'll get started with those. Um, the first one was just a clarification. If you could jump back to slides 15 and 16, uh, Dan was asking if those numbers were in millions of dollars um, that were shown. Um. Uh, billions. Uh, so, so that's. Oh uh, no! Uh, no actually, they are millions. So yes, BBVA put out a billion dollars, and and the federal financing bank put out ten billion dollars. Ten billion dollars. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Uh, the uh, next question was um, on slide fourteen. Uh, mm -hmm. How much is a typical percentage for the debt and maintenance reserve accounts? Um, in the um, waterfall that you had showed there, I was wondering what a typical percentage is for the debt service reserve account and the maintenance reserve account. Um, or if there is a typical percentage. You know, uh, quite. Um, you know, quite quite frankly, I I actually don't know the the exact numbers that those are are running at these days. Uh, the you know, the concept was uh, was was primarily that to keep the banks hold or, you know, a lot of people coming in ahead of, ahead of the equity, but I unfortunately don't have those specifics. Okay. Uh, next question was from John. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of the cost of tax equity, the all-in return expectations, and uh, what is the trend in the expectation of um, returns? Uh, it's it's pretty expensive. I mean, you know, one uh, one one thing I've heard is that it is unfortunate that the 1603 program was discontinued because you knew that the uh, that the funds would be usable by developers on a dollar per dollar basis when you are. Um, running those, you know, tax benefits through a, a tax equity investor. Um, it's the actual spendable cash that, you know, finds its way to the uh, to the actual developer is is more like half the amount that is usable by him to, uh, you know, to actually invest in the project than it would have been. Um, had it just gotten paid directly, but I would say that uh, you're looking at at high single digits, I believe, uh, on a leveraged basis, and you know maybe 150 bips lower on a, on an unleveraged basis. And essentially, okay. there is there's not enough tax equity to go around. It's it's nice if you are one of the big banks who essentially is part of this uh, oligopoly. But um, you know, tax-oriented financing is is relatively expensive with the system that we have, and you know, some of the some of the ideas that have been put forward for things like you know, master limited partnership or, or REIT financing uh, for renewable energy projects, I think would add would address would access a, a much broader investment investor base. Than the uh, than the tax equity system we seem to have come up with, um, you know. And there especially was a good uh, follow up question on that from James: Is do you think that the master limited partnerships will get passed by Congress for solar? I I hope so. I know that uh, I had actually spoken to a lawyer who had working with. Uh, who had worked with um, Chris Coons, who brought out the MLP bill last year, and I certainly didn't expect to see it last year. Um, you know, what they really did with the MLP bill was um, essentially not, not throw in too much double counting. So I think that they wanted to really apply to sort of Philosophical conservatives uh, who believed that the um, 
renewable energy market should at least be on a level playing field with the uh, you know extractive energy industry, and uh, you should have at least you know at least the same access uh, as, as a gas pipeline does. So, um, you know, I think that. Uh, I think that the jury is still out. Even even when Coons brought the bill out last year, uh, I think it was a a long term project. And you know, I I personally would love to see it. Uh, there has been so much going on in Congress that if, if 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 many senators are focusing on it, you know, quite frankly, I haven't heard about it. So I think. Uh, you know, I think I have more hope than expectation that something will happen in the in the near future. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next question was from Tom. Uh, do you have a slide that shows the available MACRS six-year schedule, standard MACRS versus bonus, or um, those numbers? Yeah. Well, it was. You know, that was. Uh, those those things are. You know. Maker schedules are pretty easily Googleable. Um, you know, that was just sort of a call on how dense to get. I don't happen to uh, have a slide, unfortunately, but the information is. Uh, you know, I can I can arrange to have that posted. It's 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 pretty easy to find. Okay. Next question is from Erez. Are there any 1603 opportunities in the market today that are already safe, harbored, and for sale? I guess then the follow-up would be, how do you find those? Um, well, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, nobody's come to me with them. Uh, you know, <laughs> we tend to, uh, you know, see projects that specifically are. Um, You know, you know, we 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 tend to see more uh, more more lease type projects, um, and and as a result, uh, our clientele are generally you know different folks than the ones who had the uh, you know the grandfather sixteen oh three deals. So I wish I had better better market information on that, but I don't. And I, I will mention that um, it, they can contact principal solar principal dot com. I'll also post my email there um, because that is something that our sponsor, Principal Solar, uh, tries to keep abreast of. The next question is from Bill: uh, Which type of structures and projects do you expect to see growing the most in the next few years, and why? Um, well. I would think that um, you know stri the straight lease business, you know, will be pretty healthy, um, you know, essentially because it's you know among the among the easiest to to understand. What is interesting to me is that the um, you know looking at use of ITC, for example, versus versus PTC, um, if something is, you know, if you want to maximize your tax credits, uh, ITC is a function of size of CapEx, whereas the production tax credit is a function of how much, you know, how much power does the project actually put out. So, you know, on a sort of deal-by-deal -deal basis, you can say, given I know my capex and I can project my energy, uh, my energy, my you know energy output. What do I, uh, you know, what really maximizes my my available credit? But even after you uh, do that math and just essentially take the PV of the PTC and compare it to the ITC. Uh, the real issue is, would you rather have a bird in the hand? You know, would you rather have, uh, you know, certainty of not having to wait 10 years for your credits? Um, 
I, I think that, um, you know, I, I really, absent uh, REITs or MLPs, um, you know, finding uh, finding a way to get, uh, you know, into common use in the renewable sector, um, I'm, I'm not aware of the, you know, any reason why the existing, uh, you know, why the universe of, of financial structures that are used today should should look particularly different uh, in the future. Although that being said, if there were if there were more players, um, there's no question that um, the tax equity is is only constrained by the amount of investors out there. And if enough new players came in to drop the returns a little bit, uh, that, that would really grow. Because essentially, when 1603 went away, um, more, uh, more, um, more pressure was put on the, on the finite supply of, uh, on the finite supply of tax equity. And I think that's probably the biggest bottleneck in the market. Okay, um, a question that came in from Dave, is the PTC the same as a FIT? So the acronyms are, is the production tax credit the same as the feed-in tariffs that uh, some states, municipalities, and European countries use? Uh, no, it is not. Um, the feed-in tariff is actually, um, you know, a statutory tariff that frequently will give you a multiple, you know, which is fixed for a multiple uh, number of years, and you know that that is the, you know, total price per electron delivered that you are going to receive. Um, the, you know, for people who get the uh, production tax credit, they are generally getting one check, you know, or tax benefits from the government at the same time that they are selling power under a PPA to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, a utility or an ultimate user. So essentially, um, the, uh, the production tax credit is a supplementary payment that comes through the tax code, whereas a feed-in tariff is the primary mechanism for selling power in those markets where it is in place. I, I hope that makes the distinction. Yep, so two checks instead of one. Uh, next question was on the ITC, what if you don't have enough, enough tax liability to use your credits? Do they roll over? Is there a limit to how much you can roll over or expiration dates? Um, let me see. I, I know that um, net operating losses can roll something like 20 years. I don't know offhand. I think that ITCs will stay on the shelf for a pretty long time. I do not know uh, the specific shelf life. I think that there is, frankly, more to lose. The, the biggest harm is time value of money. You know, most uh, most developers, their equity is, you know, somewhat expensive. So if you look at a, a whack rate or a discount rate, you know, the present value of an ITC, which is used in seven years from now, is, you know, considerably less uh, than, it, than the value it would be if you could claim it today. So I think that, uh, I think that if you can wait around, you, the ITC probably in most cases won't expire on you, but if you have to wait around, if you can't find a way of selling it to uh, to some form of less or a tax equity investor, uh, it will be worth a lot less when you finally do use it. 
Okay, and we had a comment from Mark uh, that ITCs can roll for five years, um, but still, like you said, that's a long time if you need the money now. Yeah. Um, here was a question, a fairly specific question. Uh, we are foreign investors without a U.S. tax appetite. We're looking for utility-scale solar projects with a 16% leveraged IRR. Is it reasonable that we will find investments that suit this requirement in the U.S. today? So a very specific question for you. <laughs> um, well, unfortunately, uh, none of none of our clients is uh, you know trying to uh, use use us to source uh, to source foreign equity. So um, you know, I would say that uh, there are, there are probably investment bankers who are a little bit closer to uh, to current yields. Okay. Uh, the next question was is from James. Is there a way to sell SREX from a state that does not have an RPS to federal agencies or to sell to other states' utilities? Um, no, I think the whole point of SREX is it is a – they only make sense within their states. Um, you know, a utility un, until you have a federal SREC, you know, uh, PSE and G of New Jersey is, you know, not not going to get any benefits whatsoever for buying a you know a Massachusetts SREC, unfortunately. All right, we just have time for a couple of more. A lot of questions have come in, but we will collect this entire list of questions and we'll post uh, this with answers along with the slides again tomorrow. Uh, the next one was, uh, where can I look at a list of likely tax equity investors and contacts in the solar renewable projects? Um, and I know that, Ken, you had a slide on that, but they were probably looking specifically for where would they find contacts um, among those companies. Um, or should they start with you? Uh, yeah, you know what? I can. Um, I, I think I can uh, put together a uh, put together a list of you know at least some of the contacts at uh, at those companies. Okay. Uh, next question we had was that you used the word on the partnership flip that was. It was slightly hairier than a sale leaseback. Uh, what is your preferred structure between a sale leaseback, partnership flip, and inverted lease? And is there a reason you would use one over the other? Um, well, the nice thing about a sale leaseback is it provides 100% financing. So it is arguably the cleanest and uh, the simplest form. It's also probably conceptually the easiest to understand. Um, so essentially, if you know you you don't have tax benefits and you're looking for 100% financing and you just want somebody to finance, you know, a, a solar farm, uh, so you can go sell the power. Um, a sell leaseback is probably probably the cleanest. The you know, the inverted lease is specifically designed for folks who, for some reason, the operator can claim depreciation but is only looking to sell, and you have a lessor who's only looking to buy ITC. Um, you know, that's going to be... I think a a smaller uh, a smaller population. Um, you know, in many cases, a developer either you know can't particularly use any uh, any any of the tax benefits. Um, you know, and a uh, you know with regard to tax equity, uh, in general, you will have to you will have to go back to a couple of different wells. You know, you will need a lender, you may need third-party equity, and you may need tax equity. Um, 
and basically you have to be prepared for you know be not taking any cash out for seven to eleven years so you know i i it obviously will vary with the uh specific situation of the developer but you know i I think a straight sale leaseback is probably cleanest. And this will be the last question I'll take due to time. Uh, from Tom, is it possible to sell depreciation credits without involving the buyer as an investor in the project, or does the investor need to be part of the deal structure? Um, yeah, the, the investor needs to be part of the deal structure. Essentially, you know, we just don't have sort of detachable, saleable tax benefits. You know, the last time that really existed was in the Reagan administration with so-called safe harbor leases. Um, but if you want to depreciate something, you basically have to be the tax owner, which means that, uh, you know, you have to be either a developer or less or a tax, tax equity investor. Okay, in the interest of time, I'll uh, end the session.